approximations and mathematical techniques that is very, very difficult and computationally intensive. Here, you've got a system that naturally stores the intrinsic information in a, in a quantum state. So you don't have to go through all this complicated... A question here? I was going to say, what do you mean by natively? But you just used the word natural, so I guess you... Yes, sorry, that. sorry, naturally, yeah. <clears throat> um, when you say the uh, like, no, sorry, they introduce all this, it's, is it the mm -hmm. same sort of information content uh, that the atom level as this big device level? It's yes. the same amount of room yeah. to work with. Yeah, it's exactly the same. represents both a zero and a one state at the same time. So then you can imagine that um, this bit interacting with this bit would contain all of these results at the same time. Right. Okay. If that's zero, effectively the top, if you look at both uh, qubits, the first one could be zero, zero, and it could be zero, one. The second one could be one, one, and it could be one, zero. Because it, can, it occupies both states at the same time. Am I yeah, yeah, that's correct. So what, what we're saying, sorry, is that um, this system could be um, could be a zero and this one could be a zero, but this is also a zero and this is a one at the same time, and then this is a one and this is zero, and it it's all happens at the same time. Darren? When you read the output from the register, mm -hmm. doesn't it collapse and only give you one output? Yes. So how do you get all four answers out of the system? Yeah. I'll explain that on the next slide. Right. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, so you've got Right, so this is, more, this is probably more important. What can they not do? So as Darren just said, you can never see a superposition of states. So you can't see this zero and one at the same time. What you do see is that you see, uh, when you measure the system, you see either a zero or a one, you see the classical outputs. So how can we use this superposition to help us? Well, what you actually need is you need an algorithm which takes some inputs, performs the quantum mechanical calculations on it without um, an observer or a measurement being made in isolation. And then somehow the algorithm has to find a way for the, m the most like the measurement that you make gives you the most likely answer is also the correct answer. Does that make sense? Right, so you probably get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a lot of quantum algorithms, what you find is that they're not, they will not give you the right answer 100% of the time. But there'll, be, there'll be some threshold, like 90%. So what you usually do is you run the algorithm 10 or 100 times, and then you'll find the answer that's coming out 90% of the time. And then that in itself is... 100% yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the problem is that because you need to run the algorithm multiple times, you lose some of the advantage from the speed up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I've always thought this in a specific way, and I've just been meaning to ask you for ages whether or not I'm right. Or not. The type of algorithms that are really useful in quantum computers are the ones that tend to involve kind of exponential intermediate steps, mm -hmm. like factorization. The problem is, if, if you imagine the chessboard problem, I, I, everyone's probably heard of this, you know, you put a piece of rice in the first of the chessboard, yeah. then twice as much in the second and the third, and you keep doing that up to 64 squares of a chessboard. With a classical computer, you think, oh, well, it's fine, you just put one, and then two, and then four, and then eight. By the time you get to 2 to 64, there isn't enough memory in every classical computer in the world to store that many states. Mm -hmm. But quantum computers, they don't store discrete states. You, you describe the problem, and instead of the kind of phase space of the problem branching out massively and then branching back in again to the one you want, you know, there's not enough storage space for that intermediate step mm -hmm. with a classical computer. With a quantum computer, it's, it's far more linear. You kind of start the step, you kind of entangle it, and all of that intermediate step is kind of compressed into one part, and then you get the bit at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the way of looking at it. Yeah, because um, the quantum computer can explore all the different possibility spaces at the same time, but you need an algorithm that then finds a way of 
the, the answer you're looking for needs to come out somehow. Yes, yeah, somehow you have to kind of get the right answer. Yeah. So for example, um, I mentioned two algorithms here. One of them is Shaw's algorithm for factoring, <coughs> which does have an exponential speed up. Now I'm not going to go into this one because it's, it's quite involved and it involves things like quantum Fourier transforms and stuff. Um, but Grover's algorithm actually has a nice way you can think about it because it's used for searching. So for example, if you want to find an object in a database, so you want to find an entry in an unstructured database, what Grover's algorithm does is it takes the database, it puts all the entries into a superposition, and then it uses the one you're looking for and it entangles that with the, with the database where everything's in a superposition. And what you find is that the, the entry you're looking for can actually come can actually um, be used to reinforce the entry in this superposition of the database items, and therefore you can then extract the address of where that one was, for example. So instead of in a in a classical algorithm, you take the um, you take the entry you were looking for and you go through one by one, or you'd use some other kind of clever search method. But if it's unstructured, it wouldn't help. Um, you have to go through the one by one brute force search until you found the right address and then you just read it out. Um, and if you're lucky it will be in the first few entries, but if you're unlucky it won't. In the quantum case, you can put the entire thing in superposition and find the entry in much more quickly. Am I correct to say that the mere act of actually putting in the entry itself effectively increases the chance of getting that? <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, I've got a question. You you, you say that you find it more quickly, but mm. really you find it in fewer steps. But how do you know that how long a step takes in a quantum computer? It might take longer than on a classical. Yes, it could do. It could do. But the idea is is that as you scale up the problem, because there's an exponential in your problem size, then even if your quantum computer is taking ten times longer per step, mm -hmm. then you'll you'll still get a reward quite quickly. But it could might be an exponential. Slow down. It, it might be, yes. Yeah. This is why some of these algorithms only speed up like quadratically, because <coughs> yeah, the number of times you actually have to run the algorithm and the number of mathematical steps that are involved in that is comparable to uh, the original brute force method, so you get a slower speed up. Can you like, deliberately uh, say we don't particularly care about it being inaccurate sometimes, so let's just run it once? Yes, yeah. You, you can. Um, you can run an algorithm and you can put like um, you can put a threshold on what you think is, is the right answer. So if you've got something that you need to, you've only got a 40% chance of the answer being the correct one, then you just run it a certain number of times and you can apply some thresholding theory to or decide. Or you say 40% is good, we'll go with that and run it once. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you actually need to have the whole data space in quantum registers in order to be able to search across the whole space? Yes. So you need to have a lot of qubits in order to do that. Yes, yes, you do. And this is one of the reasons I'll move on to why um, these problems haven't actually been put into practice very much yet. So um, all the theory is there, but in practice it's very hard to build these quantum systems. So. Okay, the, the other one thing about algorithms I should mention is um, new ones are being developed all the time. So one of the problems in quantum computing is that we have some hardware systems now, but we still don't have enough good algorithms to run on these hardware systems. And it's like trying to come up with algorithms in conventional computing. Okay, it's, tr it's difficult, and it usually involves some kind of insight or breakthrough to come up with a completely new idea. But people are working on that at the moment. So we might see more breakthroughs in the algorithmic side of things as well. Okay, so... Um, there are different types of quantum computers. There's, there's more than one way to make it. So I get asked lots of questions like, OK, so how many qubits have people made? What's the record? And what's the best decoherence time that you can get in a quantum computer? Well, it's very much dependent on what type of quantum computer you're thinking about, because there's more than one um, computing model in this area. So if you think about like the difference between an analog computer and a digital computer, Analog computers are very good at solving things like differential equations. They kind of solve those things more naturally than a digital computer. A digital computer, you need a much, uh, a much different algorithm to solve that kind of equation. So you might say, um, naturally, an analog computer will be more suited to solving that kind of problem. 
Whereas a digital computer might be much more suited to, I don't know, say, searching a database or something.